Thank you, thanks. Are we on? Well, good morning. It's good to see you again. We're going to do give thanks this morning. It's a, not Thanksgiving, but why wait till Thanksgiving to be thankful? Praise the Lord. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a We give thanks to the Lord. We bless His name. He is ever good to us, isn't He? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So to start off with, I do want to give a quick little update. Got a note from Doris Dunn. And there's been some good progress on preparation for Operation Christmas Child. And we're kind of getting down to the wire, wire on this in the fall season and heading toward um, the final stretch of preparations and blessing children around the world uh, through this ministry. And so she wanted to specifically um, give us this note. Pastor please, Pastor, please let the congregation know that the items most needed are stuffed animals, spiral notebooks, and colored pencils. And so that's good progress because there's several other things beyond that that we've been in need of to, fulfill, um, to fill up the boxes. So I just wanted to pass that on to, um, to those who are live here in the congregation, but also those who are joining us um, by web and by YouTube or Facebook. Um, thank you for your faithfulness and support of that ministry specifically. And as you have opportunity to bring in additional items, that would be great. In support of that, it, that ministry touches lives around the world. Amen. If you'll go to Romans chapter 12, hopefully you have a bulletin with the notes on the inside. You can follow along there and or in your scripture that you have that you bring with you. Transformed. What a theme. Transformed. Aren't you glad that God can transform us? Praise God, praise God. So let's join together in Romans chapter 12, the first two verses. And if you have that with you, let's read it together. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Thank you, Lord, that you transform us. We thank you that you are merciful to us. You are great and mighty and strong in power and abundance. Lord, you are ever glorious, and you shine upon our lives, Lord. You, you take 
pity upon your people. You give us mercy and you give us grace. You cause us to become like you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you draw us to be like Jesus. So once again, we come to this familiar portion of Scripture that we, by your mercies, that we are to present ourselves before you as a living sacrifice to pursue your holiness in our lives, O oh God, to receive what you do in our lives, to transform us, Lord, to cause us to be acceptable and serving in you, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you that in the midst of the, of the pressures of this world to conform to the things of this world, you are constantly, by your Holy Spirit, renewing us and transforming us, Lord. And this is good, and it's acceptable, and it's the perfect will of God for our lives. So as we look at this scripture today, Lord, I just pray that you will minister to us and encourage us once again to recognize what the world is doing, but recognize what you are doing that overwhelms the world. The light shines and overwhelms the darkness, Lord. We thank you for that power that's by your spirit and in our lives, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's lots of pressure to conform. It's lifelong, isn't it? It starts in the home and the family to conform in one way or another. The neighborhood, the school, government, culture, TV, movies, song lyrics, you name it. There's pressures to conform to our world. Magazines, the world, the flesh, and the devil, conform. But really, when life's over, is that what you want on your tombstone? This person conformed well. How's that for an epitaph? This person conformed well. The only escape is transformation. Yes. Transform. Transformation. Again, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, constantly sacrificed before the Lord, always surrendering to him, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know what? I love this translation, but there's, okay, okay. You know I love the Da Jesus book. I just have to go here sometimes. Every now and then I go to Da Jesus book. If you're not familiar with this, it's a genuine Wycliffe translation um, in the Hawaiian pidgin language. And let's hear what it says for Romans chapter 12, the first two verses. I do want to reflect on the last words of, last sentence of chapter 11. It says, every time we like say, God the greatest, and he's going to stay the greatest forever as right. So on that basis, we have Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Brothers and sisters, so then what? God, he give you guys plenty chance. As why I like ask you guys, let God take over you. To like you given one sacrifice but alive. But you know what God like you guys do? He like you guys go all out for God. For make like that good, you know, because that for show God love and respect. Eh, no matter how, no matter like how the people nowadays telling you how for do, more better, you guys go let, make God make you guys think different inside. So you can think new way about everything. Then you can go figure out how God like you do. And to thank God like you do, stay good. And make God stay good inside. And everything stay perfect. I like that. Stay good inside. Let God take over you. So it's not about conforming. The pressure's always there. It's about yielding to the transforming work of the Lord. If we jump to Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. Since then you've been raised with Christ... Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Since you've been raised with Christ, I have been raised with Christ. Can we say that together? I have been raised with Christ. Let's say that again. I have been raised with Christ. It's a done deal. It's, an, it's, it's already a, something that's already happened. I am raised with Christ. So set your hearts. Set your hearts on things above. There's so many things in this conformity of our world to grab a hold of our hearts, to try to take our hearts, but set our hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, and set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set your hearts and set your minds. So this transforming work that overcomes the conforming pressures of the world, the transforming work of the Holy Spirit of God, causes our hearts to be drawn toward Christ and causes our minds to be drawn toward heavenly things probably heard that old phrase, too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. What's that supposed to mean? 
I, I, I don't see that in the, in the Bible anywhere. Have you ever found that? I've never found it too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. No. You know what? Only those who are heavenly minded are of any earthly good. No. Set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above where Christ is. So that the conforming work is overwhelmed by the transforming work of the Lord. Romans chapter 8 verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh sets their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is speaking to our hearts. The Spirit of God is speaking to our minds. The Spirit of God is drawing us and leading us to His will for our lives, that transforming work. So we set our minds. We live according to the Spirit, and we set our minds on the Spirit. So we settle it. We tune our dial to what the Spirit is saying. Many times we've had, if you ever have old-fashioned radio where you actually have to twist a knob, Instead of just, you know, digital buttons and digital numbers, you twist a knob to find your channel. And sometimes you're trying to listen to a channel that maybe is far away. And you've got it dialed correctly on your dial, but there's a nearer radio station with a more powerful antenna, and it keeps interfering, keeps jumping in on what you're trying to listen to. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, And the more that you want to listen to it, the more that seems to distract. And it seems like the conforming work. But we have set our minds. We have set our hearts on the things of the Spirit. We've tuned in to the Spirit and the distracting works of the conforming world around us, it may try to yell and overwhelm the word of the Spirit, but stay tuned in to the Spirit of God. That's where we've tuned in. Ephesians 5.18, and do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. If you're full of wine, it affects how you walk. If you're full of the Spirit, it affects how you walk, our spiritual walk. Be filled with the, the Spirit and it affects how we walk. Our walk is a pursuit of purity. Our walk is a, pu present, a present um, work of God, that he is with you. He's walking with you. He goes before you, and he walks beside you. He is the one, by his word and by his spirit, he leads us. And so we, we are not to be filled with the things that the world can, sends to us to conform us and to flood out, out of our lives what God wants for us. But let's be full of the spirit of God and walking in the spirit. It affects the walk of our lives in every way. And the Spirit of God speaks a unified message. The Lord speaks a unified message to his church. Well, I found a little thing that may be a little exception. Let's look at Bezalel and Samson real quick. Exodus chapter 31, verses 2 through 5. Speaking of Bezalel, the same thing is true regarding the building of the tabernacle. God wanted a spirit-filled foreman on the job, and he told Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel. I have filled him with the Holy Spirit of God with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Now that's busy. But God anointed him to do that. You think you have a, a big to-do list in your life? Look at his, biz, his b, big to-do list. And the whole nation was watching too. This wasn't something he had a little shop in the back behind his house where he could kind of do a little tinker on this and toss it out if it didn't work out right. The whole nation was watching what he was doing, but the Spirit of God anointed Bezalel to make all these things and to make them for um, the worship of God. And then we look at Samson's life. In Judges 14, verse 19, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. He went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 of their men. Now, I bring the comparison of those two. God's Spirit, Holy Spirit of God, anointed Bezalel to make things. And the Spirit of God anointed Samson to break things. Same Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying God's calling us to go out and break things, but let's, let's trash the enemy's territory, shall we? What the enemy's trying to do, we know that we have the sword of victory, spiritually speaking. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But as God, same Spirit can anoint someone to, to build and make, the same Spirit can cause us to be that, that weapon of warfare that can break down the walls of rebellion, that can tear down the things that come against the kingdom of God. God's given us authority to use his word and to speak in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God is actively taking things in a, in a forward direction of progress. So it's really not contrary to say the same spirit that was on Bezalel is the same spirit that was on Samson. It's the same spirit, even though the, the anointing was for one was to, break, to make and the anointing for the other was to break. God is taking things forward, doing good things. And God can use us to make things happen, and God can use us to stand against the things that are wrong and tear down 
the rebellion against his truth and against his word and against his will. The Spirit of God is speaking a unified message. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, the apostle says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's a unity that happens in the Spirit of the Lord. Verse 4, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Live that life that is worthy of the calling, the patience, the gentleness, the bearing with one another. Keep the unity of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is active in our lives. That's a transforming work. The conforming work is a, is a dissipating work. The conforming work tears apart. The conforming work, even though, you know, show your individuality, become just like us. Well, that's, that's what conforming seems to say. But you know what? It turns into destruction. The more people reject God's ways and seek peace without God, it turns into violence, it turns into quarrels, it turns into distress. Whenever we deviate away from God's perfect will, things fall apart. The conforming work is a work that actually destroys. But the spirit of unity of our Holy Spirit of God, who orders our life, he takes us into unity, he brings us together. That's the transforming work. We can't get there on our own. So many voices say, oh, can't we all be at peace? And I brought this up before in another setting where it's interesting how that if you watch some of these um, award shows or, or country music show or similar programs that they do annually or whenever, and so many of the speakers talk about, let's all come together in unity. Let's all find the good in one another. And let's all have, recognize the peace that belongs within our own hearts. We're all at unity. Um, and everybody is good, and everybody's noble, and everybody's right. And then those, those award shows are immediately followed by the evening news. Murder, and fight, and stealing, and violence. And the real world is a little different. Now, I'm not speaking against the hope of having peace and unity and harmony, but we can't accomplish it on our own. We can't accomplish it by feeling good and, and having a good thought about one another. We can't accomplish it by just singing songs um, about peace and joy and happiness and love. Um, those are all nice things. But we want to get there, but we can't get there without God. We can't get there by conforming to this world and the pressures of the devil. We can only get there through the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. So we keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Where God's spirit is, there's peace, there's liberty, there's joy, there's a comfort, and there's a unity. In Revelation, God anointed the Apostle John to write to the seven churches that were there in Asia Minor. And in each call out to each of these churches, every time it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And it's plural, to the churches. There's a unified message. Each church there had a different situation going on. But in every single case, it said, Here, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches. There was a unified message, even though in each situation, either there was a rebuke or a counsel or a correction or an encouragement. In one of the churches, actually, there wasn't anything that had to be called out for, just an encouragement for them. But the other, sixes, there were, the other six churches, there were issues they had to deal with. But the same message kept continuing, that God was taking them toward unity, toward purity, and toward his will for their life. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In Revelation chapter 2, the first church that's brought up is Ephesus. The church who was, that was really good at doctrinal purity, boy, they understood the doctrines, and they kept purity in their doctrine, and they, they were hard working. Oh, they rolled up their sleeves, and they went to work did all kinds of good works, but they weren't guided by love anymore. And they had to be pulled up short on that and say, the Spirit of God is saying to you to return to that first love of God and love one another in his name. You know, that also brings up the point so many times people love to, in the world, they love to quote Jesus saying to love one another as you love yourself. That's the second greatest commandment. But you know what? You can't obey the second greatest commandment until you obey the first greatest commandment, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If we try to love one another without God's guidance, it turns into self-love and it winds up in quarrels again. So always start with the first things first, right? To 
to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So the loveless church there in Ephesus, even though they worked hard to bless one another, they weren't doing it in love because they'd lost that first love of the love of God in their hearts. And so they were called to return. And it says in verse 7, Revelation 2, verse 7, To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Eternity is on the line, depending upon who and what we love. Eternity is on the line. If we lose that, our love for God, we've lost our relationship with God. Because if we don't love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength, everything else falls apart. And our lives fall apart. But if we return to a true love of God, through the power of the Spirit, in the name of Jesus, that we are one those who can get to the eternal, eternal paradise of God and eat of the tree of life. The second church that's mentioned is Smyrna in Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11. They were a heavily persecuted church, and they were, they were faltering a bit in their faith. They had to be encouraged to be faithful. And verses 10 and 11 say, Do not fear any of those things which are, you are about to suffer. How's that for a warning? You're about to suffer, but don't be afraid of it. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. There's a crown for those who follow the Spirit, and follow the voice of the Lord, and endure whatever's coming. Not be afraid of what's coming as long as we stay close to Jesus. So again, there's an encouragement. There's a unity here of taking his people forward. There's a crown of life awaiting. The third church that's mentioned is in chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, the church in Pergamos. They were a compromising church. They were, they were saying, well, we can get away with this sin and that sin and tolerate this sin and that sin. And the word of the Lord came, no, you cannot. You must remain pure. And verse 17 says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, there's that word again, overcome. I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. There's a spiritual nourishment for those who, who pursue purity. Sometimes the, the conformity to the world looks like it may just add a little flavor to our lives, but it, you know what, it's poison, not flavor. But if we're purified in our hearts and minds, and let, him, let the Lord transform us, form us to be like Jesus, there's a, there's a hidden manna, there's a spiritual nourishment for our lives. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. There is a personal Abba Father relationship with, with God that you have. You know deep within your soul your relationship with God. And when you realize that you have surrendered everything fully to him, Lord, look upon my life. Let nothing deviate from your will for my life. Purify me completely. Own every part of my life, Lord. If there's anything in my life that I've been, been in hiding about, Lord, point it out. And root out anything that's wrong. I want to be pure and right with you completely. And in that attitude, you know your own heart. That you're at peace with God. You're received by him. And there's just kind of a secret place in your own heart that you have with God. The church in Thyatira is mentioned in verses 18 through 29. And they were a church that had been corrupted and had deviated. And there was much, a stern warning for them to repent and return. And a promise to overcome Verses 26 through 28. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I have also received from my Father. I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Who is that morning star? It's Jesus. Who is the one who rules? It's Jesus. If we allow corruption to happen to our lives spiritually, in our thoughts, in our actions, in our behaviors, what do we lose? We lose Jesus. The greatest thing is our relationship with the Lord. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. How he gave his life for us and how he, he ever lives to, to be our savior, our deliverer, our redeemer, the intercessor for us. Don't lose your relationship with Jesus. Don't let anything try to out, crowd out that relationship with him. And so... This church that had gone corrupted, the word came and said, you must be purified, you must repent, and in doing so, by overcoming, I give you Jesus. Don't lose that relationship with him. That's the mean thing. That's the biggest thing of all. The church in Sardis is now mentioned in Revelation chapter 3, the first six verses. And he said, you are dead and you are alive. You're alive and you're dead. You know what? 
if, if, you have, if you're a live person but part of you is dead, that's a, that's a problem, isn't it? If something dies within you, that's a problem. And so he said, as a church, you're alive but you're also dead. That's a warning sign. Do something immediately. Verse 5 says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, in every one of these messages, it's to one church, but it's to all the churches. The same unifying message. In this case, if there's something that's deadening, we're at risk of our names being blotted out of the book of life. And we want to hang on to life in him. Then what's mentioned is the church in Philadelphia, verses 7 through 13. And there's no correction for them. They have faith in the Lord. They're encouraged. They're blessed. They were the faithful church. And so beginning at verse 12 and going through verse 13, here we have overcoming again. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God's going to make us famous. God's going to make us established and stable. He's going to make us a pillar in his kingdom, in his temple of my God. And he writes his name upon us. We are redeemed. We belong to the Lord. So as we are faithful, we become a strength for others around us. And that's one of the da dangers of conforming to the world. When somebody looks to our life for guidance in some way, and sometimes we can tell when somebody is looking to us because they might ask us questions, or they might, um, you know, we, we know they're observing our lives, but sometimes we don't know when somebody's watching. We don't know when somebody's trying to learn from our life. And if we deviate, we remove from their life a pillar that they need to look to, a pillar that has the name of God written on it. But if we're faithful, God causes us to be that pillar. We will be an example to those around us. So that's a message to the churches. And then the seventh church that's mentioned in chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, is the church in Laodicea, the lukewarm church. And if you understand, remember the, the analogy behind that. And we're told that in that city of Laodicea, that the, the water that sprang up from the wells was kind of lukewarm. It wasn't cold. And you could make it hot if you, if you heated it up. But it was just kind of lukewarm from some of the springs they had there. And it was an example of what was happening in the church there that they were kind of just so-so about the relationship. They added Jesus to their lives and kind of had a box for Jesus to be in. And the Lord said, I'm coming to enter your hearts and lives. I'm coming to take over. Verses 20 and 21 through 22. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now just think about that. We built a house of our lives, and we declare ourselves Christians, my life to be a household of, of faith, my life to be the temple of God, but guess what, I've closed the door and left him out. And he's knocking on the door and said, hey, you, you've chosen my name, you've chosen to declare yourself to be a believer, can I come in? He said, I'm on my way, here I come. So the lukewarm, we know about to spew you out of my mouth, because it's just, um, God just can't handle it anymore. But you know what, get on fire for Jesus, Let's let him inhabit our lives. So let's not push him out the door. Verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, it's plural. Every single one of these churches gets the same word. This message is for that church, but it's a message for every church. It's a message for our church, for every church around the world today. Let's purify our lives. Let's put him first place. Let's re return to our first love. Let's be a pillar for our God. It's a unifying work. The Spirit of God is transforming, and the world is trying to conform us back to its ways. Stay transformed. Keep going forward, because the Lord is knocking on the door. The Lord is... Per Microphone changed. Smile and wave at the folks, Michael. Don't we love our tech guy? Amen. So the pressure to conform to this world and to this world's master can be obvious or it can be subtle. 
I remember in a conversation with someone who was um, fishing on a river, and they were noticing there was somebody there in another boat nearby them. They were trying to get up as close as they could to the boundary line of the no fishing zone. Um, there's certain zones where you can fish, some certain zones where you can't fish. And they wanted to get up really close to that zone, and the water was running pretty swiftly, and they, they nosed the boat up there pretty close to that boundary line. They tossed in an anchor in order to, to um, be kind of stable in that spot. But you know what, that anchor took fast, but the water's current was pretty fast and strong. And what did that rope do? It started pulling the bow of the boat downward. And they were stuck in one spot. And as I recall the conversation, um, they rushed over and helped them with a knife and cut that rope and let the boat go free. You know what, don't try to anchor your boat close to where you're not supposed to be. Don't anchor your boat there because the current of conformity will get a hold of you one way or another. Cut loose from it. There's another simple illustration that somebody had said about a child at bedtime, um, lights out, parents go to their room, and then after a little while, a little clunk and a whimper, and the child, she'd fallen out of bed. And the parents said, well, what, what happened? And she said, I fell asleep too close to where I got in. <laughs> now that's an illustration, isn't it? The world's trying to conform us like gravity, pulling its direction. Don't fall asleep before you got in. Get in and stay in. Let our, our lives be transformed. Transformation happens. Sometimes it's subtle, but sometimes true transformation becomes very obvious. Perhaps you've heard and, or seen the videos um, of the documentaries from George Otis on transformation. Entire communities that have, have come to the Lord, been in revival, and all the changes that have happened. And, you know, it wouldn't be great if our community had that kind of a transformation too citywide, where taverns have to shut down for lack of customers, where police department personnel start baseball teams so they have something to do. You know, we need that kind of transformation that can happen. It's said of the, of the great Welsh revival in 1904 that so many of the people got saved, gave their hearts to the Lord, so many of the, of the miners, they had to retrain their mules that worked because they all stopped cussing. And the mules couldn't understand the commands anymore. You know, even, even, the, even the mules understand they, 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 can, they find out that a revival has happened. We need that kind of transformation, don't we? So transformation is one person at a time. And transformation can be a revival that hits and touches many lives. However trans transformation happens, there's always that gravity of confirmation or conformity trying to pull us back. But stay in. Stay in the spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We all. Don't you like that? We all. The Lord is that Spirit, and he's working on every person's life. So if you have a conflict with somebody else, know that the Spirit of God is working in their heart. The Spirit of God is working in your heart, too. And if there's any kind of conflict or difference, realize Maybe God is telling me to maybe change the way that I relate to that person. And maybe God's at work and the Lord maybe is, is stirring in them something that I don't have to say or do. The Lord's doing it in their life. Be patient and give room for God to do the work in their hearts. We all are being transformed into that same image because the Spirit of God is transforming us in a glorious way. God has glory for our lives. God's not out to hurt you. God's not out to destroy you, ruin you. God's out to bring glory, his glory into your life. I love Psalm 84 where it says, the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. I just love that verse. And he's bringing a glorious thing in our lives. If our walk is upright before him and purified lives before him, he brings glorious things. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now there's transformation. Where are you in your life today? Do you need the Lord? Let him transform you. Do you need more of the Lord? Let him transform you. It's his work. We're a new creation. The old is gone. So that conforming tug of the world, you know what, it doesn't have power over you. Recognize it when it's coming and stay in that transformed new life in Christ. There have been famous examples of transformed lives. We think of John Newton, the slave trader. God got a hold of him and, and redeemed him and showed true grace and forgiveness. And now we have that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, because of the transforming work that God did in his life. We think of 
Nikki Cruz, we know Dave Wilkerson's book, The Cross and the Switchblade, and gang leader in New York City, gave his heart to the Lord, became a, an evangelist for the Lord. Famous transformations. Actors, politicians, celebrities, famous examples. Well, guess what? Let's each one of us become a famous celebrity transformation ourselves. Celebrate that God has transformed me. Because in somebody's life around you, someone needs to know just what he has brought us through and where he's taking us. I want us to look at Colossians chapter 3, the first 17 verses. I've printed it in your bulletin. I'd like for us to read this together. This is the NIV translation. Colossians chapter 3. And this, I think, is a kind of a checklist. Lord, am I being transformed in each of these areas? Or in each of these things that's mentioned in this chapter? It's a powerful chapter. It covers a lot. But it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to self-examine our hearts. Lord, is in any of these areas, am I conforming to the world? Or am I allowing you to transform me? So I invite us to read this together, shall we? Colossians chapter 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for these kind of checklists that we have in your scriptures, Lord. Any area in my life, if I'm deviating away from your pure transforming work, if I'm not like Christ as I ought to be, and I'm conforming to the world's ways and the world's attitudes and the world's emotions and the world's counsel instead of your pure truth, Lord, then point out to me, Lord, where I need to return to that transforming work that you do. I thank you, Lord, for this word today, this transforming work and so many more scriptures that we could find that talk about the transforming work, Lord, because you seek a pure bride. You are purifying our lives. We thank you for the work that you do, Lord, as we surrender ourselves to you. Lord, if anyone's hearing these words today, their life's not at peace with you. I pray that you'll point out just how beautiful the cross is, the place of redemption, the place to come to, receive forgiveness of sins and new life. And as we surrender ourselves to you and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you come in and you're no, no longer knocking at the outside door, but you're in our lives, Lord, and you rule and reign in purity and in power and in glory and in joy. So do that transforming work, we pray, by your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.